biggest challenges you had in trying to work a saxophone into some a kind of music that isn't generally like Yeah, um, I mean, just uh, the dynamics alone, I mean, there there's such extremes, especially, I mean, we're talking about some, like, volume levels that most saxophone players don't normally have to deal with. Um, so I had to find a way to um, kind of get at least somewhere within the mix of the of the of the guitars and the basses as well as the drums for that matter. So um, amplification was obviously a necessity. Um, you can't quite amplify a saxophone the same way you can amplify a guitar sure or a bass. Yeah, I've done that. I've 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 been I've been experimenting for years. Um, many different ways of dealing with that. Um, I used to use a small little like SM98 mic from Shure and I would tape it on the inside of the bell and, uh, with, a, and with a real thin wire off it. And uh, that worked okay for a while, but just like the, the tonal quality just wasn't, or the tone quality wasn't there. We're talking about uh, utilizing all these effects. Some of these, these are guitar pedals predominantly. Um, guitar players have um, pickups that don't pick up pretty much anything else except for guitar strings, of course. Uh, as a sax player, you are usually um, have to rely on something like this, a microphone, which doesn't, um, regardless of how much you can get on the mic itself, it still picks up the sounds around. So that's a constant struggle, um, is that you're picking up everything else um, around you. Um, and particularly when it's for the saxophone, the microphone may be pointed downward towards the bell of the horn. Uh, and what normally resonates down there is you know, a bottom end, some bass tones, uh, kick drum, etc. That stuff can wreak havoc with delays and things like that, especially if you're in more of like a, a cavernous type of a stage area where the ceiling might be a little lower. Um, like once again, like I said, playing in different in, in environments, you have to be quick on the fly to be able to like dial stuff in as fast as possible, figure these things out within a matter of minutes, you know. So, so how do you deal with that problem you're just describing? Exactly the way I just said it. I, I, ha I have three to four minutes to like figure out what's up, um, what's going to what's going to work and whatnot. If there is time um, allotted for this, um, I'm just saying you know realistically this is what happens. But uh, in, in in the best case scenario, um, usually you can work with a sound person who can sort of like EQ out a lot of the lower frequencies that the mic is picking up through the monitors themselves. That's the only issue you have. I mean the stuff going out uh, front of house is totally fine. It's a completely different mix, and they can you know actually. Uh, tweak that out to sound, you know, sound nice and everything. But uh, uh, on stage, uh, you, might, you may have to do something like that where you just cut all of the low end out of the monitors. Um, then you won't have to deal with that as much. Um, the other problem is is that, uh, at least for myself, I really like to push the effects as much as possible, cause I'm, especially with delays. Like I use some heavy delays where because uh, the slap back on the delays I actually play off of occasionally. Um, once again, can wreak havoc in the higher end of, of, of the sounds and whatnot uh, may just cause things to just begin to whistle out of, out of out of anywhere you know out of nowhere. Once again, catching things going on around uh, you, guitar, bass, drums, vocals, whatever. Um, so yeah, like I said, sometimes it's like a like sort of like I'm tap dancing, you know, with different pedals. I'm you know knobbing things, and once again, I've got this big brass instrument hanging from my neck, so I'm trying to do it without looking like I don't, yeah, without. Just, yeah, that, that too. Yeah, definitely trying not to hurt myself, but, uh.